Well, if you have your Bibles with you, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to Revelation. Revelation chapter 2. We're on the church at Pergamos this morning. Starting with uh, chapter uh, 2, verses 12 through 17. Make sure you don't have your microphone.
It's according to whether you're walking with God or you're doing your own thing. God knows you. He knows the intents of your heart. He knows this, this church here. And He knows their dwelling. Addressing the church in Pergamos, the, the risen Son of God says, I know where you dwell. And He says, I know you, you dwell in right in the seat of Satan. So as Jesus dictates this letter, he acknowledges that Satan is also, or also does live in Pergamos. You know, as I look at the cities and the major cities of our country today, I, I, I kind of have a feeling he lives there too. But also some of the small cities. So in this precious place with a master of the assembly had placed his people, Satan not only was dwelling there, but he was reigning there. Now what does that mean? It means that things were going his way. As we look at our world today, I learned, it looks like things are going Satan's way, don't it? I mean, look at the laws that we're passing. Look at, look at the things that we're cheering on and, and we parade and we, and, and we, you know, make great things over. It's amazing. The people you see on TV, the commercials now, they can't even run a commercial without having some lesbians or, or, or gays on there. So I mean, you think, man, look, look at where we are. Look at our place. Look where it, 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 it appears to me that, that Satan is reigning now. So we understand that Satan exercised sway in Pergamos, and those saints who lived there were required to confront this wicked one every day. They worshipped in a city where Satan's seat was, where, where he dwelled, and Pergamos was a stronghold of Satan. So in other words, it was like they were doing hand-to-hand -hand combat with Satan every day. Does your life seem like that sometimes? Yeah. Yeah? And sometimes it seems like Satan's on you and riding you and, and trying to tear you down and beat you up. This church knew what it was to live in a pagan city. Satan's seat was there itself. And, and, and it would seem that again that his seat is in all our major cities today. So Satan had obviously established the center of, of, of this place as his operation, the center of his operation. Now, I, I don't know why, but he did. His headquarters seemed to be there according to what Jesus is saying. And so satanic power was manifested right out of that city. Bad things were happening there. But guess what? God placed the church there. God placed the church there. Amen. You know, God placed Big Lake here in this community for a reason. Amen. We are to be a beacon to this community. We are to be shining the light of Christ. We are to be doing all we can to express Jesus to a lost world. Many today, though, think Satan is just a figment of their imagination, a cartoon character, or in a fairy tale. But I'm going to tell you something. He's real. He's real today. He's working in our world today, and it seems and it appears to me that, that, that he's working overtime. It don't seem like Satan's taking any time off. He's not been going on any vacation. It seems like as we look at the society in which we live and the things that are happening in our country, Satan is alive as well and Satan's busy. And I want you to understand he would nothing, like nothing more than to disrupt your life. You see, that's what he was doing in, in Pergamos. He, he was doing everything he can to disrupt these Christians' lives. He was doing everything he can to try to tear them down. You know, the Bible refers to him as the God of this world and the prince of the power of the air. He's real. He's powerful. And he wants nothing more than to destroy lives and testimonies of every Christian he can. Satan intends to kill you. You are a child of the living God. And we're going to have to deal with him until the Lord binds him up and casts him into the bottomless pit. I'm telling you, I'm looking forward to that day too. Amen. 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 People say that when the rapture comes, 
they like to go into rapture, and they're, they're right before they go, they like to give old Satan a kick right in the mouth. <laughs> Nevertheless, we must never lose sight of the truth that Satan is powerful. This was a congregation situated in a crucial location, though we must wonder whether they truly realized how essential their, their presence was. And we really understand the, the value of people at Baptist Church and where we are today. How many people have been saved on this hill by hearing the word of God? How many lives and families have been touched by the ministry of Big Lip Baptist Church? We are important to God, whether we know it or not, I understand that. And it's important that we stay busy for God. It's important that we keep trusting Him. It's important that we keep the faith. It's important that we keep on keeping on and don't slack up. Amen? Without necessary planning to do so, the congregation fulfilled the vision of C.T. Stubb. I, it was a British missionary. Look at what he said. This was his famous quote. He said, He said, Most people want to live in the sound, within the sounds of the church bell. He says, I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. Our job is to reach people. Our job is to save people. And he understood that stuff then. And this church was in the middle of Satan's seat trying to do that very thing. He knew their dedication. The saints of Pergamon, they, they had been appointed by the, 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 by the risen Lord of glory to conduct their ministry and to stand firm in what many would be tempted to call an impossible situation. The Lord will and does appoint churches to minister where Satan dwells. These churches are meant to be lighthouses and rescue centers for those who are lost and under condemnation. The churches are meant to uh, withstand wickedness and shine in the light of Christ uh, and the Lord Jesus in this dark world and in the dark corners many times of where God places them. Mm -hmm. Compared to where God has placed many ministries, uh, folks, we hear is big liquor in paradise. But let's not be fooled. Satan's at work not far from our doors. Satan's busy not far from our doors, okay? Churches are meant to serve as hospitals for the wounded and dying, you know, resisting evil and promoting the righteousness of Jesus. So the congregation in Pergamon had experienced opposition and persecution, but the congregation stood firm in the face of all this opposition. These believers knew Exactly what it meant to become a follower of Christ. It, it, it meant the, the, the commitment of all that they were and all that they had. Even the possibility of death. It seems to be that they were in hand-to-hand -hand combat with Satan, I'm telling you. So we look here at, the, at, at, at the, the scripture here of Jesus speaks of Antipas, his faithful martyr. History tells us that Antipas was the pastor of Pergamus, and his name meant against all. But he stood against all that Satan brought and paid a heavy price. He refused to proclaim Caesar was God and was placed in a bronze bull. And a fire was built under it, and Antipas was roasted alive. Church, that's dedication. Church, that's devotion to Jesus Christ. He had, he had not died in vain. Jesus knew his name. Recorded it in the Word of God. He was a witness giving testimony of his confidence that Jesus was the Son of the living God. And he yielded up his life in proof of it. Do we have that faith? Reasonable to think that Antipas killers intended his death to intimidate other believers and coerce them to quit witnessing and maybe run them underground just to hush them up. <coughs> we say that we are committed to Jesus, but are we really? Are we this committed that we're, we're willing to put our lives on the line? Will we stand in the face of death? Does Jesus mean more to us than life itself? I don't like to preach.
preach doom and gloom, but persecution is coming to America. It's already happened in Canada against the preachers who preach against sin. It's happened to some of the churches in America during the pandemic. There was a Christian apologist named Tertulli. He wrote this. He said, kill us. Torture us. Condemn us. Grind us to dust. Your injustice is proof that we are innocent. Therefore, God suffers that we thus suffer. A tank on our purity is considered among us something more terrible than any punishment and any death. I like how he finishes it. The oftener we are mowed down, the oftener we are mowed down by you, the more in number we grow, the blood of Christians is seen. You know, it's funny, and it's so true, though, what he speaks, because if, if we want to look where Christianity is really growing, it's in those countries that are, that are being persecuted. It's in those countries that have to hide. China is growing leaps and bounds in Christianity. It's amazing how the Word of God in our, our enemy country, we call them, where Jesus is moving and working. God works in the midst of His tormented people. The, the living God brings glory to His name through the suffering of His people. They were also dedicated to purity and doctrine. Jesus commends them uh, because they held Jesus' name and, 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 and did not deny the faith. They had not denied the faith of Christ and they believed Christ and, and the Word of God and studied it and taught it. They had neither denied Christ nor His Word, and the Word of God was being preached and taught every week from the pulpit and from the classrooms of that, of that church, that small church that was being persecuted so bad there in Pergamos. The church was loyal to Christ's name despite the environment. What's well, especially com commendable here is that it, that it did not run from the responsibility. They stayed at the task that it was, even though it was difficult, the church had been established in a cesspool, a worldliness, a city of people who were consumed with the pleasures and the possessions and the comforts of the world. And they kept on keeping on for Jesus. That's where we got to be. That's where we got to stay. No matter what the rest of the world do, we've got to keep on keeping on for Jesus. And our next point is this. The Lord knows their problem, though. And their problem is compromise. And I, I really believe this. This is what needs to be in. on a whole lot of churches in America today, even Baptist churches, written across the door. That is compromise. Compromise. We're compromising in so many ways. It's ridiculous. Folks, I don't care what you think. I, I don't care what the Bible says. And the Bible says that, that God calls men to stand in the pulpit to preach. God calls men to be deacons in the church. That's God's word, not mine. If you don't like it, take it up with Him. Don't get mad at me. But that's the word of God. I don't believe in, in allowing sexual sins to be accepted and exploited and, 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 and even, you know, we're, we're ordaining homosexuals and my God, what's wrong with us? Compromise. We're letting them sing in the choir and lead the music and everything else. Even in our own county, this is happening. The Lord knew the compromise. Per Pergamos had heard the the dreadful words, I, I have a few things against thee. And, you know, if Christ was to come down right now to Big Lake Baptist Church and say that, oh my God, what would he say? What would he say to have against us? He's talking about you. talking about me. He says, I have a few things against you. He said, so, uh, some were, were true Christians, but not all. I like what I heard from the pastor's wife, and you know, we look at our congregation today, we see many pews that are empty. I like what they, I like what that she said. That the pandemic has kind of purified the church. It's got those non-believers out. 
condemn that according to the doctrine of faith. My goodness. The faithful were doing the works of Christ, but they had allowed some among them who were not. The true church was mixed with those who, who, who thought uh, or taught false doctrines. We cannot compare our sta stand on, uh, on our, excuse me, we cannot compromise our stand on the Word of God and the doctrine and, and gain favor and, 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 out, and all the uh, uh, attendance of the world. We, we can't do that. I mean, there, there's so many churches that are compromising and, and, and their mindset is this, whatever it takes to get them here. Whatever it takes. That's hogwash. We are to never compromise the Word of God. We are never to compromise our moral beliefs just to get up here. Amen? Amen. I will tell you something. If you that the church wanted to paint over this thing last week, is black. Cut out all the lights and put me on the spotlight. I'll quit and go home. Anytime you want an hour worth of music and 10 minutes of the sermon and say how wonderful and beautiful you are this morning, and you leave going to hell, you forget it. I'm going on. I'll go somewhere else, of course. We cannot compromise our stance on the Word of God or the doctrine of the Lord. Many of those churches, and many of them have, they have that mindset we cannot lower our standards for the sake of numbers. This world, the lost, are, are not going to, to like true doctrine. It's, it's, it's against their nature. But it is what they need. It is what will save them. It is the only way, the one way to have it through Jesus Christ in Him. Lord, Savior, it's the only thing. A true Christian doesn't mind in God's truth. Amen. You know what I found that out? I, I found this that you can come in here and you can preach the hardest message you can preach. But I will tell you something. A true child of God, they think I'm bothered. They love Jesus. They know it to be the truth. Then you'll have those that leave out with the you know, this steam and the smoke coming out of their nose. They're mad at the preaching. They're preaching the truth. Mad at the preaching. And you ought to be taking it up with God. Amen. The church and its members allow worldly activities to take place in the church and the, and the homes of their members. That's what was happening. This church began to baptize and accept people as members who have never truly repented. The church and its members allow false teachings and preachings. I like what Randy Alcorn says here. The prosperity gospel has poisoned the church and undermined our ability to deal with evil and suffering. It's true. The congregation at Pergamos had, had compromised with evil for the sake of monetary peace and the assembly of uh, compromise with what they knew to be evil. Verse 14 and 15, you find there that they were, there was corruption in the church. So I have a few things against it because thou hast uh, have there the, them that hold the doctrine of Amon. Who told Balak to cast the stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things, sacrifice unto idols, and to commit fornication? You go back and study that back in Numbers chapter 22 through 25. It teaches that Balak, the king of Moab, hired Balaam to curse Israel. He tried to curse Israel three times, and every time it failed. But you know what he suggested? He suggested to Balaam, so I'll tell you what to do. You want to bring Israel down? So we just got to, you just got to send your women over there to them. They need to, they need to get in there and intermingle and to marry them and bring your, your gods into the, the tribe of Israel. That'll bring them down because it brought in all kinds of hellish worship, even the sacrifice of babies. So again, as Brother Wayne stressed, <laughs> they the worship's going on today because we're killing our babies. Killing our babies. Baal sacrifice. What was happening was that the church of purpose become a mixture of religion and worldliness. Folks didn't think you can't let that happen. It happened in the purpose church, it's happening today. Never baptize those who have not repented and forsaken the world. 
Jesus spoke again here in verse 15 about the Nicolaitans here. The Nicolaitans here. And, and so he says, I, I hate that thing. And one of the traditionals hold that the, what it was, these were followers of Nicholas, one of the seven who was chosen to oversee the distribution of food in, in Acts. And apparently, he became so liberal and turned away from the truth of the gospel and began to accept every evil as okay. That was one of those gospels that said, you believe in Jesus Christ? Yeah, you can just go do what you want to do. You can live however you want to. You can stay drunk. You can stay shacked up with, uh, with whores or whatever you want to do. You're all right. The result was tragic. There was those within the church committing fornication. That is all kinds of sexual sin. And there was those participating in drunken parties of the world, even to the point of participating in the feast of idolatrous worship. Sadly, this doctrine is alive and well today in churches. Many want the pleasure of sin through the week and God on Sunday. We can't have it both ways. And we cannot have too much. My last point, the Lord knows their needs. The Lord knows their needs, and I want you to know He knows your need this morning. But as we look at them, what do they need? They need to repent. You know, some that's something's old fashioned, isn't it? Repenting. That's something we don't hear much anymore. Repent. God knew what they need in the one word, repent. Repent. The church and its believers needed to repent and to change their ways. What does this mean? The church and the true believers needed to deal with those who were worldly and, and lead them to repentance. They need to change its practice of accepting people into the church just because they made a profession. Needs to discipline those who refuse to repent and choose to continue in the worldly living. You ever go back and read some of the yeah, get some of them old books? What does Avon in? Right okay. there. Let they bond, let they bond read, let you read some of the old stuff back to the beginning of the day. That's some of my home church. Well, back then, if you, somebody remember her, said, heard you cuss. And, what is it? and you never got back in until you got up there and repented and confessed to the church. That's for forgiveness. Just cursing, not drinking the beer, just cursing. Is that your phone? They dealt with it. They didn't put up with it. Is that your phone? They believed and preached and practiced righteousness. Righteous living, following God and putting Him first. We've gotten so far away and we've gotten to compromise so much. See, the church of Pergamos was allowing the world to seduce it, deceive it, mislead it. And it was breaking God's heart. They needed to do what the Ephesians church did and had done. They purged themselves of those false teachers and those who practiced idolatrous and immoral practices. If they don't, Jesus said he will turn the sword of judgment on them. God said, listen, church. I love you. And do you true saints keep on keeping on? But I want to tell you something. If loud something in your midst that you got to deal with. And if you don't deal with it, I will deal with it. 
God calls His own people to repent. And the preacher will honor the living God and He will call all who hear to repent. The redeemed need to repent when they may been, uh, you know, begin to imagine these things and these horrible worldly things and they've forsaken their honor and their responsibility to God because they've been swayed and they've been deceived by the world. It's time to repent. You know, the Bible tells the Chronicles that when the church gets right, God will heal the land. The lost need to repent concerning their rejection of the grace of God to pursue their own twisted desires. Repentance is still a message that must be proclaimed today. Repentance for the child of God means that he or she will shake off the encrustation from all the worldly contamination and get back effectively serving God and not be continuously dragged down by the things of the world and being dragged down to the level of the world. Repent leads to God's blessings. Next we see here they need the heavenly manna, the heavenly bread. And this was a promise to them. God, he promised the hidden manna. Manna was a honey-flavored bread that God used to, uh, to feed the Israelites during those years of wandering in the wilderness when they came out of Egypt. But what is the hidden manna that John refers to here? The overcomer is given the right to eat of the manna or bread of heaven. What is the bread of heaven? It is Christ Jesus himself. Amen. The bread of heaven. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. He also said, I am the living bread which come down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give be my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Bread of the man of God is not physical, material bread. It is spiritual bread. Amen. It is spiritual food for the soul. It is bread that men really need more than anything else in the world. I want to tell you something. You may have come in them doors this morning thinking about your needs in life. You need this and you need that. But I'll tell you what you need. You need Jesus. Amen. Because Jesus can provide everything else. Amen. The only bread that can permanently feed and meet the needs of any soul. Any soul that is groaning in hunger, restlessness, emptiness, void, loneliness, lack of purpose, or feel like they have no meaning in life, come to Jesus and he'll give you meaning. Note the man is hidden. This, this simply means that Christ is hid to the worldly crowd, the worldly people, the worldly do not see nor feed upon the bread of heaven. Christ is here from the world, but, but we can come to the Lord's table and find nourishment for our souls. So the overcomer is given also a white stone, it says there. A white stone. Do you have a white stone this morning? See, there's an endless number of guesses about what this stone means. I looked and I studied and I studied it. And you know what? It's simply this. It's a gift given to those who surrender their heart and life to Jesus. You know, it's best is to take the scripture said the white stone is meant to be for those if they're ticket to heaven into the presence of God. The overcomer is allowed into God's presence because of the white stone. Jesus is the white stone. In that day, the white stone was awarded to, to victors in the athletic contest. They got a white stone with their name on it. Also, a white stone was given to ju by judges to those who were found innocent. It's proof of innocence. Soldiers received it after victories in battle. They were oftentimes broken and, and shared with friends to redeem a, a time of need. They were given as tickets to special occasions. A groom would offer a white stone as a promise to take his bride. 
So the white stone is given to overcomers <coughs> would have a new name written on it and that no one knew except of those who receive it. And this speaks of our individual relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me ask you something. Do you have an individual relationship with Jesus Christ today? Do you? Do you get up in the morning and you're calling out to the name of Jesus? When you lay down at night, is it Jesus? And, and all in the day between the morning and the night, is it Jesus? Are you having that relationship with Jesus that you need? And you don't need to go through anybody else. It's straight to Jesus. The Bible clarifies that Jesus is our mediator between us and heaven. When we want to communicate with God, it's going to Jesus. Aren't you glad for a new name? I'm no longer the man I used to be. Jesus has given me a new name, and I, and I belong to Him. And that name's recorded in the book of life, never to be erased. Every child of God shares an intimate relationship with Christ, and our names are different, but the, He knows each and every one. He knows you this morning, amen? As I draw to a close here, though, I want to ask you this. Do you have or have you received the white stone of salvation? Do you know that you know that you know Jesus <coughs> today? Or if you're here today lost, I beg you to come to the Lord. But also talking to you as a church, is there things in your life that need to be cleaned up? Because in every one of these letters, Jesus said, I know. I don't know what you do during the week. I don't know what you do on Friday nights or Saturday nights. I don't know. <laughs> but he does. He knows about it before you put it on Facebook. He does. He knows everything that's going on in your life. And the, and the stress here is if, if it needs to be repented, Jesus in all his churches was telling them five out of seven, they needed some repentance. They needed to get right with God. There are things in their life that, that ought not to be there. And, and for something in your life, there's something you need to get straight. Uh, again, get it right with Jesus. You see, repentance will bring God's blessings in your life. There's nothing better than walking hand in hand with God. But if you haven't received the white stone of salvation, if you, you haven't been awarded that white stone, I'm going to tell you something. You're going to miss out on that. Will you come? Whatever the need this morning, whatever's happening in your life, whatever's going on, Jesus knows. It's time for you to deal with it. It's time for you to get it. He knows as we stand to sing. Lord, we sing. Five ninety eight. God speaking to your heart. When you come.
the most important decision you ever make in your life, whether he is yours. Second, are you going to fall? Alright. Anybody have anything they'd like to share before he just leaves? <laughs>